Hi, everyone, and welcome to Right About Now. I'm your host, Jonathan Small of Writing Partner Consulting. It is a pleasure to have you here with me today. My very special guest is the multi-talented Tempany Deckard. Now, those of you Aussies listening to the show may know Tempany well from her starring role for three years on the hit show Home and Away. Others might recognize her name as an author of acclaimed young adult novels. But to me, she's the creative genius behind the amazing course that she teaches at UCLA, How to Write a Novel in 10 Weeks. Now. 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 Tell me about how you came up with the idea of how to write a novel in 10 weeks. When I was a kid, I used to be an actor and um, I loved writing. I really wanted to be a writer. In fact, I'd, I'd, I'd submitted ideas to publishing houses as a kid and tried to become a writer at root, like 12 and nothing had really panned out. And I was a successful actor in Australia and um, I had the opportunity to do a lot of audio. What did you do in Australia for those of us to be uninitiated? <laughs> okay. So I was on a soap opera, a nighttime soap opera called Home and Away, which pretty much any Australian actor you know has been on. It's like the two major shows in Australia and it's a rite of passage for an actor really. Right. Um, and it's on every night. So everyone watches their, has their dinner while they're watching it. So you become really, really famous really quick. And how old were you when you were on that? I was 16 when I was on it. Okay. So that must have been interesting to be a teen yeah. doing that. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I was on it for three years um, playing a really colorful character, very different to myself. So it was, it was a challenge in a lot of ways as a teenager. Um, but yeah, so I finished the show and I'd gone to New York and I studied acting at the HB studio. And one of the courses I took was playwriting. And I love the playwriting so much. And it just brought back all my, my dreams of becoming a writer and a novelist. And um, so when I came back, I started writing plays back to Australia. And I was doing these audio books for Scholastic as an actor. And one of the heads of Scholastic said to me, oh, oh I noticed you won this playwriting competition this weekend. I saw it in the paper and he said, I didn't know you wrote. And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, well, we're looking for a new teen book series for girls. Do you have anything like that? And I said, oh yeah, I do. I do. And so I said, I'll send it to you. So I go home and I start writing the book. I'm like, okay, because I better write didn't. something. But you didn't have any. I didn't have anything, nothing. So I had to teach myself how to write a book. And I wrote to him and said, oh, my computer's blown up. I can't get the file out. It's going to take me a few weeks to get it to you. And really, that was just buying me time to write the book. So, you know, I think I wrote it in less than 10 weeks. And then as uh, I started traveling around um, doing motivational speaking for kids about acting and following your dreams and becoming a writer, and the main question that would come up all the time by the teaching department, usually of, of schools I was traveling around to, was how do you write a book? I really want to write a book. I've always wanted to write a book. And it just got me thinking, well, I know how to do it. But you had no training. You taught yourself. Yeah, I just taught myself. So I was like, well, and I had a little system in place as to what I did. And I was like, well, I taught myself how to do it. So I'm sure I can teach someone else how to do it. So I put together a little class with a few of my friends and we experimented with it. And um, it was just this huge success. And um, what I noticed is I could pretty much get anyone to write a novel. And depending on their, their already their writing ability, naturally, it, it, it changed the way the book was, of course. But I could get them through the main thing that most people seem to have trouble with, and that is completing it. And so that was this, this wonderful realization I had. I was like, oh, I can actually get people through this. And then it just snowballed from there and it got better and better and better. And why 10 weeks? Like why, why that short a period of time? Uh, I don't know. I guess when I came up with the, the lesson plan, I could see what needed to be worked on and for how much time reasonably, like, you know, in a perfect world, I would like it to probably be 15 weeks mm -hmm. where we spend about three to four weeks editing uh, because I think editing is actually where you do a lot of the writing. The 10 weeks is a good enough time really as a psychological thing. It's like when you buy something for $9.99, you feel like it's more of a bargain than $10. Yep. You know, so when a student says, oh, it's only 10 weeks, I can tackle this. 10 weeks is doable. Whereas if you say some, to someone, write a novel in six months, most people will be like, oh, I can't do that. But 10 weeks, anyone's got 10 weeks. You know what I mean? Like it's, 
taking Tai Chi classes for 10 weeks. You know, you can do it. So it motivates people to actually do it because they know it's not, it's only a 10 week investment of their time. And it isn't actually 10 weeks, right? Tell me about that. It's actually. So really, and I don't tell the students this till they get in the class. So don't tell anybody. Yeah. Don't, (laughs) hopefully no one's listening. Um, But uh, basically they spend five weeks setting up the book and figuring out what their book's going to be about, structuring it, um, figuring out the outline of the plot, and then they write it in four weeks, and then they have one week of editing. So (laughs) it's it's a crazy class. And, you know, if you, you told anyone to do that, they'd be like, that's impossible, but they all do it. And I've now got much, much better at figuring out how people don't do it. So now I know when there's a problem and when they're going to try and sabotage themselves and I, I get them off it very quickly. What are some of the biggest sabotage? Definitely research, to- overthinking the manuscript or overthinking what it needs to be and coming up with excuses as to why they need to finish the whole thing at another time. Like, well, you know, I can't fully finish it right now because I need to research this whole thing about gorillas. And it's like, actually, you can get away with writing a book without a lot of research. You know, do the research after you've got the bones, (laughs) you know, just get to the end of the plot. Um, So it's usually research and then um, second guessing yourself. I'd say that's the main thing. So what happens is you'll make a choice in your book and then you'll be like, oh, I really think maybe I should be going this direction. I'll start again. Yeah, and then you never do. Well, then what happens is you end up starting again and again and again and again because you get a million new ideas as you go through. And you just never finish. I hate to use a Trump quote, but I think it is a Trump quote. It's better to make a decision than no decision. Yep. So just stick to something, do that badly throughout the whole draft, and then once you have the draft, go back in and fix it. At least you're going to finish you know, otherwise you will definitely be in no man's land forever. And that's what happens with most writers. They get through 50 pages or half the book and they just never finish it. And you mentioned research. So as far as research goes, that's just people saying like, well, I need to really know a ton about this before I even start yeah. writing rather than just starting to write with what yeah, they know. Yeah, exactly. Like I can't write this until I understand how elderly you know, Iranian women make their dinner. You right. know what I mean? It's like, actually, you can just make that up. Yeah. Just make it up and back. then figure it out later. Yeah, that I can. That is such an obstacle. I've, I found myself facing that one too. Mm-hmm. Like, I just don't know enough about 18th century Right. And also, literature. and then just, just researching is fun in it of itself. Like, you know, you can sit there for hours Googling into a dark hole of right. like about something and it's, you don't even realize you've been doing it for like an hour, you know? So you, you have to sort of stop yourself and go, let's just write the story. Um, okay. So I am a student and I'm sitting in my first day of your class, write a novel in 10 weeks. What are, what are some of the exercises we do just to, to jumpstart the class? Okay. So we always start with what I call writing out the trash, but really it's, if you've ever done the artist way, it's Julia Cameron's morning pages. Write the book artist way by Julia yeah, Cameron. Which it's is a great book. Great book. I highly recommend everyone take that course. Um, so basically it's just writing with a, a pen and a pad, just anything that's in your brain. It's not supposed to be literary. It's not supposed to be something that's read out. It's just supposed to be you writing quickly and just getting whatever's in your head out. And it does a couple of things. A, it starts getting used to write, you writing again. It is a muscle and, you know, you want to really be flexing that muscle. So you just want to get into the whole stretching of it again. And two, I think it gets out a lot of annoying stuff that's in your head that you're worried about in that present moment. Like, oh, I've got to go pick up my kid and I need to get groceries and, oh, you know, my mortgage is coming due or whatever. You can just write all that stuff out and just let it be. It's a meditation. It's meditation. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think it's really important. Just like no it, judging, you're just yeah, writing. no judging. No one's going to read it, you know. And I think, I think I have some students who do morning pages and try and make it like good writing. And I'm like, don't do that. Just write about how much you hate the woman next door because her dog barks every morning. You know, like just right. write just the purest thought that's coming out of you. And how long do you have them writing out the trash? Well, in class we do it for two minutes. So it's not very long. And then for homework, I get them to write two pages every morning, which is a lot more. And you have them do that in longhand, right? Not on yeah, the computer. Yeah. Why Why longhand? Explain that to me. I think something comes out of you a little differently when you handwrite. I think it's really important. 
I think it activates a part of your brain. And in fact, they've done studies where it does. Um, it activates a different part of you that pressing keys on a computer or, you know, back in the day, typewriter doesn't do. And so I think it's a, a little bit of a left brain, right brain activity. And I think it's really important to engage that part of you. And just to feel like it's a tangible, tactile thing, like writing is a thing you're physically doing. Because I think sometimes on the computer it doesn't feel physical because you're barely yeah. moving. And it just gets it into your body of just like, okay, we're writing now. I need, to, I need to activate my creativity and my subconscious creative right. soul. You know? it, it definitely mo uh, activates a part of your brain that is dormant a lot of mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. And you have people, you suggest people do morning pages. You you have them to it two different ways, right? They do it in the morning. Yeah. And you, and you also try and have them do yeah. it at the We do the do two different weeks where we do it in the morning and the evening to just see when you're a better writer. You know, like some people write better in the evening, some people write better in the morning. And then throughout your life, that can change. You know, you might have always been a morning writer and then all of a sudden you're not. Right. You, like you have kids and. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're, you're, you're asleep you're by asleep. nine o'clock. Yeah. 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 And so that's important to just figure out, you know, before you write a novel, when am I going to be at my best self to be creative? How early do you get up to do your morning pages? Um, I used to get up pretty reasonably, like at seven, you know, and start work. But now that I have two children, I have to wait until they're at school. Yeah, right. <laughs> because nothing's getting done until yeah. they're out of the house. And that's the other thing, you know, you've got to, you've got to change things to your environment. I also recall that you do some mindfulness with them, like you have them just breathe a little bit yeah. and sit quietly. Yeah, we sort of quieten down before we start writing. And also, I think that's been really beneficial. I do that a lot more now. I get them to do a lot of imagination exercises about their characters in strange situations, just to get to know their characters more, just in a dreamlike way. So there's no pressure, there's no getting it right or wrong. And just seeing, you know, how does your lead character get a tooth removed at the dentist without drugs? You know what I mean? Like what kind of patient are they going to be? You know, and yeah. that can tell you a lot about your character that, you know, that's probably never going to be in your plot. But suddenly you know so much more about them on their fear levels and their tolerance levels. And just like it's a good way of getting to know your characters in a very layered way with there being no pressure. And it's very easy. Like these imagination exercises, they only take a minute. Right. You know, and anyone can do them at any time. Like you just close your eyes and imagine your character, you know, walking down the street and getting attacked by a dog or walking down the street and meeting Pavarotti or someone, you know what right. I mean? It's like, how does your character react in, in a myriad of ways is going to bring ideas to your novel. So it's almost like an improv exercise, right? Yeah. You give them a character, a situation, yeah. and like a thing. Yeah. And then you say, go, write about it for five minutes. Right, And right. then they read it back to the class. Yeah, so we do the imagination exercises and then we do writing exercises and, and it's the same thing where, you know, they have a few things, a few parameters, um, usually a few strange objects, and then they see what happens to their imagination taking their lead characters in these places with these objects. And that usually reveals stuff too. And nearly always those things end up in their books. That's so interesting. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Just because it's just something that inherently they want to write about? I think what happens is when there's no pressure to write something, often you write the best stuff. And so they often find that those little exercises produce the best writing. And it's kind of... <sighs> It's frustrating in a way because, you know, when you're sitting down and you're really working hard to write well and you're actually writing worse than mm -hmm. you would if someone said, oh, just write something for a couple of minutes. You know, you're like that whole thing of like, if I give every all this pressure and force into this work, it will be better. And actually the opposite's true. Yeah. It's like, just chill out, just <laughs> take a back seat. Yeah. And then the, the work's flowing. So often those exercises produce stuff that, and it surprises them. You're not controlling it so much. You know, I think when you sit down to write a book, you're really controlling it. Like I want it to do this and then this and then this. And if you can just let go a little bit, you, your creative subconscious is usually way smarter than you, way more creative and can join the dots of your novel much more easily, I think. Right. If you let it, but that's the trick. And the only way to get into that place is being more relaxed, meditating, having no pressure, all these things that as a writer – we have the complete opposite of, you yeah. know what I mean? Like we're tense, we're trying really hard and we're stressed, <laughs> exactly. you know? Yeah, it's the opposite. 
Um, I know that you had talked about sort of, you know, finding your muse and then mm-hmm. referring to your muse right. during the whole writing process. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about that? Like yeah. what you mean by that? Well, you know, and there's a few people who do this and the main people who do it are musicians. Uh-huh. So like Beyonce does it, you know, when she goes on stage, she, I think she calls her character Sasha Fierce, mm-hmm. right? And the only way she can perform at her best level is imagining she's actually someone else because she's kind of a little shy and, and sweet and, she knows as a performer she can't be that. So she imagines she's someone else and allows herself to go to that place. Now, as a writer, I feel like when you get stuck, a great thing to do is to create a little being. You can call it whatever you want. I always have people draw a picture so they visually know what it looks like. And I usually get them to make a small little monster that's not human usually. <laughs> um, Why is that? It's, it's just more fun. Yeah, okay. you know, it's more fun. Yeah. And, um and then, and, and also, so it doesn't, it doesn't take on the, the personality or characteristics of someone they know. Yeah. You know, so it really is a whole Can it be a person. cat? It can be a cat. Good. In fact, there's Good. a lot of cats. Okay. A lot of cat monsters end yeah. up in the class. And then you, when you get stuck writing or you're tired of writing or you feel uninspired, you tell them to write for, say, three pages. And mm. so you are, you're imagining that this little creature is actually doing the writing the creature's not in the story. This is where people get confused. The creature's not in the story. The creature is writing the story. And so it usually takes on a slightly different tone. Like the creatures are usually snarkier or funnier or drier or it could be, it's usually the opposite of your personality. Yeah. And so it, the tone will change a little bit, but then you can just go back and edit it later on. But it's a great way of exploring your book differently and also when you get stuck, having a device to get unstuck. Yeah. And giving you confidence because now it's not, it's not you necessarily yeah. writing it. It's yeah. You can blame that you. thing. You know, yeah. it's like, oh, that it's, thing's oh, that, making yeah. all these mistakes instead I blame of me. Sasha fears. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So in order to inspire people to come up with ideas for their novel, what are some exercises that you do? The main one that we do is I get the writers to write out a character list and I don't allow them to think about it. They have to answer, I think it's 17 questions to create a character. So we start off with that. I always think great books have great characters. You know, you can have a great plot, but if you don't have a great character, it's just you don't connect. Yep. And I think that's integral. So they answer these 17 questions. And what, like what, what are some of the questions? Name, age, appearance, Basic uh, stuff. family, education, uh, work, all the basic things you'd probably put on a dating site, I'm sure. Um, but then we get into a few interesting things like um, what would the character die for? Oh, that's know? good. Um, or what is a secret that they've never told anyone? And, you know, if you think about it as yourself, you probably have a secret you've never told anyone. Yeah. And that's fascinating. That alone tells you everything about a person. Why wouldn't they tell anyone that? Why are they ashamed about that? Why are they keeping it a secret? How did that shape them as a person and what age did it happen to them? You know, so stuff like that's really important and and they don't have time to really think about it. So they just say things on the fly and then it starts to create, basically, I think my class snowballs. Mm -hmm. So you start off with one idea and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and you're just letting your imagination flow. And before you know it, well, I also think your creative self, the subconscious does know what it wants to write does know the story it's going to write. You don't know it. You right. have to connect with it and then it comes out of you. So by doing these funny little arbitrary exercises, even though you think you're coming coming up with these answers off the top of your head, I think they're deeply ingrained in you as a person wanting to bring these characters and these stories out. Um, but it's a great way of having no pressure and thinking it's just coming out of you randomly. But I don't think it really is because usually by the end of the class, I'll ask everyone, how does this story, this fictitious story, relate to some aspect of your life? And nine times out of ten, every single student will realize it has something to do with them. Um, I have a couple of good examples of that. One guy who is a fantastic screenwriter, a sci-fi screenwriter, took my class. And he was writing this book. I don't want to ruin his plot, but <laughs> basically it was about monsters on, uh-huh. on a spaceship and stuff. And uh, he said, oh, oh, I know what this is, how it relates to my life. And he goes, I I had no idea. He goes, it's about me being jealous of my wife and my son having a closer relationship than I have with them. I'm like the odd man out. And that's what was happening on the spaceship. 
you know and it was just like it was like he, wow it's therapy that's yeah. like oh it's totally therapy yeah. like usually after my class people get a divorce they change careers <laughs> they go traveling around the world because they realize something about themselves that they've been hiding essentially I, I think you once told me that people also like end up having, you know, getting married or having like yes. romances that they yeah. never had. Or deciding to have a baby or like big life yeah. changes, stuff that they've been hesitant on. And I think there's something about writing a book that heals something within you or acknowledges something within you that you've been avoiding. So are you doing those character sketches of, of the protagonist, antagonist to you? Or is it, is it your first you do it for your main character? Yes. Yeah. And then do you do it? Do you keep doing it or did you sort of within that? Within, within the class, I just get them to do it for the, the main character. And then their homework is to do it for all the other characters. But, you know, how often are they doing it? Probably not. You know, students yeah. are bad. You know, so... <laughs> they're just bad students. Yeah, they're just bad. If I'm not checking it, they don't do it. But I think they nearly always do the, the enemy character. I do have a section where they have to do another list for the enemy character. And then I say to them, you should be doing this for all your sub characters. Yeah. You need to know all these characters well enough so that you have juice to draw from for elements of the book. You know, your A, B, C, D and plot lines are not going to develop unless you know many layered aspects of your characters. So how does the fleshing out of the characters lead to the idea for the actual book, the story of the book? Okay. So let's say you discover that your lead character... Uh, really likes making cupcakes, mm -hmm. right? And you didn't realize that. That's something you just made up. And they also have a fascination with watching watching surgeries online. Okay, so suddenly that that plants a seed in your your subconscious creative mind. And then when we start writing little exercises, maybe that comes out. You know, I've told you that your character walking through a city street and they come across. Uh, abandoned dog and mm -hmm. a shopping cart. And then because we put in that character list that they like cupcakes and surgeries, maybe they happen to stop at the cupcake store that's across from the hospital mm -hmm. just by chance and then decide to take the cupcakes, cupcakes into the hospital to give it to one of the surgeons and ask if they can watch a surgery. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's been planted and it often comes back into the little stories. Right. And then the, the writers get to play with these little stories and experiment with them and see if that's something that actually works or doesn't work. And then that may be an instigator to, okay, what is my plot? What is the biggest problem for my character for this story? And maybe it is they need a career change. They want to go from being the baker to mm -hmm. the surgeon, you know, yeah. so that, that, that then creates the storyline. So is the next step after fleshing out the character is to write like a plot summary, a brief yeah. plot summary? And I think this is a thing that a lot of beginning writers are very hesitant on, which is structuring your plot. I think there's a romantic view that you should sit down at your desk at 11 o'clock at night with your glass of whiskey <laughs> and your houndstooth coat on and your pipe. Your Ernest Hemingway. Yeah, yeah, and sit down and the novel just comes out of you. Well, you know what? I think that happens to maybe 1% of the population. I think it does happen. Right. Um, but and I think maybe it happens once in your lifetime. Yes. Yeah, well, you yeah. just write one book. That's yeah. right. You know, I think if you're, you're starting out as a writer, this is a great way to understand structure, to understand how to get from A to B to C. And so we create what I call the beginning, middle, and end. So we understand the larger scheme structure. So what's the, what happens at the start of my book? What happens in the middle of my book? What happens at the end? And then we break it down to chapters. Okay, well now what's going to happen in every chapter? And okay. so I get them to fully structure what's going to happen. And everyone hates it. Like those yeah. two weeks we do that, everyone hates it. Like they're regretting the class. They yes, want their money back. True confession, I, there is nothing I dislike more about writing than outlining and planning yeah. it out. I oh, it's so it. boring. It's so boring. And it's hard. <laughs> like it really hurts your brain mm -hmm. because you're trying to create this world that you don't know yet. So it's very difficult. But what happens is I believe that you can have the best creative, amazing moments when you're restricted because you're restricted within these boundaries you've created with an outline. Suddenly this creativity can just fully fly. Whereas if there's no creative boundaries, i.e. no outline, you often get writer's block or you get stuck or you start rambling and just writing innocuous passages you don't need. Well, this is why people don't write 
novels in the first place because it can be about absolutely anything, yeah, right? So then you're like, much. it's too much. It's overwhelming. They want yeah. somebody to just tell them, you make the book about this or, you right. know, or they, they, they want to feel like it. the book has to be about this. So, you know, you will end up in your class working on something. Like right. you have to make that decision, right? right? You have a parameter. Yes. Now. I say it's better to make a decision than no decision because yeah. a decision moves you forward. No decision leaves you just sitting there twiddling your thumbs. And also... I believe that you can't figure out how to make a great novel without having figured out how to make a bad novel. You know, you should start with writing writing it incorrectly so that then you can go back and, and realize how to make it great. But you can't often make it great without understanding how it's wrong. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. you need to write. And I say, have to we are writing a bad novel. Write your first really bad novel. <laughs> That's really a good sales pitch. Yeah. yeah. And then everyone can do that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's like no one has a problem writing a bad book. Yeah, this book sucks. Yeah. But then they've got this bad first draft, which I will say, you know, over the years of teaching, I'm always so amazed at what people come out with. They're never bad. Right. You know, like well, that's I'm, because you're so positive anyway. Uh, <laughs> miss, but miss it's no fascinating. Yeah. It's like, you know, they all think it's terrible. And then we read them out in class and everyone's like, wow like everyone's fascinated they're like oh my god this is so good and and while you're writing it you feel like it's the worst piece of crap ever but then when you read it out and you see everyone's loving it you're like am i deluded in what's good and bad because you are you know how do you silence that little voice in your head that tells you when you're writing this is the worst thing that has ever been written like you i'm sure you even have that voice i get that voice all the time absolutely like this is terrible i think what's helped me is i recognize that one day I'll think it's bad and one day I'll think it's good, the same material. And so I recognize that I'm not a consistent judge of my work and I'm not a reliable judge of my work yeah. because it changes on the day, yeah. what I think is good and bad. And I really think going back to meditation is the key where like if you do any traditional meditation, it's like take it easy, take it as it comes, Mm -hmm. don't take anything personally, just let it flow, don't worry, don't judge. It's just don't judge. Right. And I think you can you're allowed to judge when you say it's time. So once you write that first draft, then you say, okay, now I can judge it. So I can make it a good second draft. But it's hard. You know, I'm I'm not gonna say it's easy. That's the hardest part of being a writer. Like I I always equate it to playing golf. It's like if you have a bad golf game, it kind of ruins your day and you feel horrible about yourself. Same with writing. If you have a bad writing day, you feel useless. Right. And yet if you have a good one, it can be one of the most exhilarating feelings. But it's so hard to get to that that moment, that high. And it's never consistent. (laughs) It's never consistent. You never know when it's going to come or go. Next day it's awful and you're back to square one. The best thing about writing is that, that you're just done with it for the day. Yeah. Um, okay, so the beginning, beginning, middle, and an end as the structure of your novel. Are there certain you know rules that you give as to what needs to happen in the beginning, what needs to happen in the middle, and what needs to happen at the end? Yeah. You know, I go back to a lot of screenwriting technique, mm-hmm. which I think is really helpful because people these days, I think, are, are watching more film and television than they are reading books. So I think they can understand um, mythic structure better through those examples, Yeah, which is a bit sad, but it's true. It's just um, the world we live in. Yeah. We don't live in Dickens' time. No. <laughs> so I always say start with a big problem for your character, mainly because it's more fun to write. You know, yeah. you can start off with this lovely, rambling, poetic beginning of a character and their world and everything. But you know what? It's not that interesting to write. So start with them stuck in a toilet. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> start with something fun to write. Yeah. Okay. So start with a problem. And then the middle should be the problem has. They've been trying to solve the problem, but now the problem has got worse yep. for different reasons. And then we're going to get to the end of whether this bigger problem has now been solved or not. And that shapes the genre of your story. You know, if, if, if the problem doesn't get solved, it's a tragedy. If, if it does get solved, it's probably a rom-com. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it's, you just work within the genre. But And that's always easy to do. If you ask someone to come up with a problem for a character, they can do it. And then coming up with a bigger problem is the heart of it. And often I have to push writers to really go for the jugular, which I think is really interesting. People mm-hmm. often play small with their creativity and their, their nervousness about what a character should or shouldn't be doing. And they often don't want to really push them to these dramatic places. Which, Why do you think that is? I don't know, but I know it happens a lot. Um, like they'll be like, oh, and the character uh, is struggling to 
get their high school degree or something. I'm like, that's not interesting. Like, well, maybe it's because they want to make it, most people want to make it real, right? Unless they're writing fantasy fiction or something. Right. And they think real, there's like sort of a mundanity in yeah. being real, you know, yeah, but probably. actually, you know, art elevates life. So, and right. they're afraid that if they make it too big, like instead of, you know, right. he loses his job, he gets abducted by aliens, <laughs> that it becomes, it gets out of the realm of, right. But there's something in the middle there, right? Yes, yes. Maybe he loses his job, but he also, you know, loses his family. You know, maybe it's just right. the, the problem is a lot, is magnified. Well, I always equate it to if someone tells you a story just about something that happened to someone they know or even themselves. And they go, oh, I had this terrible thing happen to me. I ran out of cleaning fluid and I couldn't clean the kitchen and it was so stressful all day. And then the kids came home. It's like. You know, like, yeah. oh, I really don't want to hear your stupid story about the cleaning fluid and how you've had such a bad day because you couldn't clean the floor. Like, who right. cares? You know, but if you tell me, oh, I had a terrible day, um, my neighbor dropped dead on my doorstep, suddenly yeah. you're like, and then what happened? Yeah, and then, you know? what? and then, yeah. I think when you're starting out writing a book, go for gold, you know, like, go, yeah, for, go for it, overdo it. And then you can start refining it, bring it back to reality a little more if you're worried you got ridiculous. You know, it's better to extend than to not go far enough and have this kind of meandering nothing that no one wants to read. You know, like push the boundaries a little bit, mainly because it's just more fun. Mm -hmm. It'll inspire more ideas and then you can refine it back to being <laughs> more yeah. sophisticated. Or more, yeah, more real in your, in yes. your mind. Yeah. Okay. So once you've got the beginning, middle, and an end, you said to start writing chapter summaries. Is that mm -hmm. kind of the next step? You yeah. write just little summaries of each chapter. Yeah. Write little and summaries, which is really hard. That's like the, the most stuff challenging up. Yeah. Thing. That's the outline that's in. That, so that's your equivalent of sort of the outline where you're writing yeah. like what happens. Within these, the parameters of that beginning, middle, and end. Right. And I break it up with like the beginning should be chapters one and two. Middle should be, you know, a bunch of chapters. And then the end should be a couple of chapters. You okay. know, it's like. So it, give it, it gives you an idea of where to aim. And so did we take, I mean, I'm, we might have talked about this. So it's the beginning is the problem. Then the middle is your solve, your, your, the problem escalates and you're yes. keeps getting worse. And then the, you resolve it at, at the end. You were, right? Well, or maybe or, not. Or maybe yeah. not, but the, yeah, but the end is a sort of. Yes. Something has, basically the character has to have grown by the end one way or another. So let's say the problem is they got stuck on, stuck up on top of a Ferris wheel and then the Ferris wheel starts rolling down the hill and they're clinging on for dear life as the middle. And then the end is the Ferris wheel hits a tree and they all die. But then the character mm -hmm. goes to heaven and discovers that by being on that Ferris wheel, they saved their grandma for coming to visit them and also dying or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm just make, making yeah, it up. Yeah. But the character should have grown. And if they don't grow, it's a tragedy. Right. And so hopefully maybe Hamlet. someone else grows. Like yeah. maybe their son or maybe someone else involved with them. They change. The character definitely changes. Yes. Themes. Do you, how early on do you have to sort of think, what is the theme of my, of my book? Very early. I think that's the most helpful thing when you're writing. If you have a theme in mind, like this is a battle of the underdog story, mm -hmm. that will shape every chapter you write and how you write it. I also think genre is super helpful if you can commit to a genre up front and say, I'm writing comedy. You're going to write totally differently to how you write as a drama. What about like if you're saying I'm writing young adult, which you've done a lot? Young adult's interesting. Um, young adult is basically writing adult books. It's just with teen protagonists. So I kind of think the same rules apply. There's not really anything different about young adult other than the characters are younger and they're doing younger people things. <laughs> so you shouldn't censor yourself like, oh, that's kind no. of R-rated if I put a curse no. there. Or... No, and I, I think... Back in the day, yes. Mm -hmm. Like 20 years ago, you couldn't write a lot of stuff in young adult. Yeah, now you can write anything. Now you, you, in fact, you should write anything because they want to feel that also it can be crossover fiction. They want to know that this young adult novel could be sold to adults so they can make enough money. Yeah. <laughs> so from a marketing perspective, you want it to cover those bases. But one of the things that I would imagine and i've thought about writing young adult books um is that you know i'm not a young adult anymore so i will mm -hmm. i really be able to capture sort of the language that they speak now even though i do have young kids yeah um young adult kids you know is that important do you think like if you're yeah. if you choose to write in a ya form yeah i think yeah. it is and i think it changes yeah. that's the hard bit um i think it's constantly evolving kids are constantly evolving in how they communicate and especially now with technology, I think they're yeah. communicating really differently. And I think the way they 
structure okay. sentences is really differently because they're so used to abbreviating everything. Right, everything's for um, text or, yeah. And I think that that is definitely, you know, a trick to get out of that <laughs> is to have your character be an unusual character, like the geek yeah. or the nerd or, you know. That's, that's what John Green does. His, yeah. They're always like super smart. Yeah, they sound like a 40-year-old man, yeah. you know, because, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. and, but it works because yeah. he says up front. He's this quirky, academic, nerdy guy, or you know, they're always <laughs> highly intellectual. That's a very know? good point. Yeah. Yeah. So you can trick you can trick your way out of it. And then some people just naturally do it. Like I just had a student, I think she's in her sixties, and she wrote about like nineteen year olds. And her voice is so accurate as a nineteen year old. And she's just she's just good at channeling a nineteen year old. And I think if you're genuinely drawn to writing tween and young adult fiction there's a part of you that's that's very alive at that time of your life and you'll probably be able to write it pretty well if you're just writing tween and young adult fiction because you feel like it might be something interesting to do or try you might have a lot of trouble and also a lot of people do it because it's really where their most deals are being made right yeah it's the most popular yeah of genre. but also i think it's the hardest place to get published because yeah. it's so competitive and i think they're doing really amazing things with young adult right now it's very sophisticated and it a is. lot of it's been done so you know it's really hard to yeah. write something can't do any more dystopian apocalyptic right. young adult or vampires right or but they will those, the, yeah they will <laughs> Someone keep will. doing or somebody will figure out the next new thing okay so back to your class you're choosing your genre and i think that's very important because you just want to understand you know and and you, can you can you do hybrids? Can it be a yes? A dramedy? Yeah. I or... call them slashies. Okay. You can have as many slashes as you want, and and in fact, you know, sometimes people in my class come up with like slashies I've never heard of before. Like, this is historical vampire fiction with a futuristic subplot, and you're just like, yeah. what? You know, and, <laughs> like, and it it's interesting. amazing. <laughs> you know, just from yeah. your genre, you can start inspiring yourself with ideas do you think you should start reading books within that genre if you hadn't already just to kind of get yourself yes. or, or does that kind of intimidate you because you start reading books that are really good in that genre and you're just like yes i, can never I, I think this. both i okay. think it will absolutely terrify you and intimidate you but i think it will also help you to understand where you need to be going and and i think sometimes depending on your age you can have a warped sense of what you're writing if you're not keeping up with things yeah you know like i wrote a, a kid's book a while back and my agent's like this isn't gonna work and i was like what do you mean and she goes things have progressed from here and i was like what do you mean <laughs> what was the topic like oh it was like i thought i was writing a young adult novel and she's like no this is for like 10 year olds oh. and i was like what do you mean and she goes read this and she gave mm. me some young adult book that had just been written and it was so sophisticated and grown up and yeah. like mine looked ridiculous compared to so, it. So it's a middle reader or whatever they yeah, call that. Yeah, yeah, middle grade reader. Middle grade. But I had no idea because back in my day, that was what I was yeah. reading as a young adult. You know, right. so I think I do think Beverly you should Cleary be reading. And yeah. And good writers are good readers. I think you should be reading, 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 reading no matter what. And you also want to be reading in your genre to make sure you're not writing something that's already been written. Yeah. Because that happens a lot. A lot. It's, it's pretty hard to come up with a completely original idea, right? Yeah. I mean, they say there's only seven stories in the world. Right. But uh, it is helpful. It's kind of like when you're writing a screenplay, you want to start watching movies that are in that genre, just so yeah. you understand. Because you yeah. can study them and sort of the way they're structured, the way they're... Yeah, totally. And, and I think, you know, rather than us all being this competitive society, we should just be building on everything. You right. know, build on all the amazing things that have already been created and, and expanded out. I think there's a a grand negativity going on within the artistic industries out there of like, well, I need to do this and I've got to do this. And, da -da -da -da. Yeah, yeah. and it's like, it kills the art and, and the reason why your thing will be good. If you're, you're panicking about what everyone else is doing, you know, you need to just honor it and say, Oh, that was amazing. How can my thing be a, a, as amazing? You okay. know, after the chapter summaries, what's the next step? So then you start writing. And I would like to say you should hold, hold off and really master those chapter summaries. Okay. You know, go over them more times than you think because you will be lazy and you'll be like, yeah, that's fine for that. But if you have vague concepts in your chapter summaries, like Martha and Ben get together and have a fun time. You know, it's like that doesn't mean anything. It should be Martha and Ben go to the market, enjoy different foods in the market. They yeah. go, they catch the trolley. They then go for a surf down at the beach. They come home and they watch their favorite movie. You need to be specific about what happens in your chapter summaries. And is there a way that the, each chapter should end? 
Like, is there is there a? I th- I think it should come to some kind of resolution for each chapter or a cliffhanger. <clears throat> okay. Um, depending on your genre, you know, like if if you're writing a comedy, it doesn't really matter. Anything can be happening as long as it's funny. But if you've got a thriller, you wanna you wanna drop a little red herring or a seed of why you want to turn the page. You know, absolutely. That's interesting. Okay, so yeah. now you're writing your book. Now you're writing. Tell me how that works. What, what okay, are some well, of the- I think <clears throat> you should be reading your outline for your chapter before you start writing, um, which, funnily enough, a lot of people don't do. And then... Do your morning pages. Do your morning page. I start with a meditation just to get clear and, and change hats from whatever else I'm doing to being a writer. And then uh, do your, your morning pages. And then I definitely think a lot of my students have started using a timer. Hmm. I think this is very helpful. And say, okay, I'm going to sit down for an hour to two hours, depending on how much time you have. And I don't get up till I'm finished. Some people find they have to do it in 30-minute increments and give themselves a 10-minute break. Yeah. And then back to 30-minute increments. But you cannot get up. Okay. And you just have to write till you're done. No Tra- email on. Yeah, emails off. All that Phone stuff. Phone is off. Yeah, distractions, Any distractions. Are off. Yeah. And no, like, oh, I have to research this before I write this. Let me just yeah, go on Google no for research. one minute. Research yeah. is procrastination. Totally. Yeah, you got to do that at another time. That's not your writing time. So two hours, you think, is a good block of time? Yeah, yeah. I don't think you can really get a lot done in an hour. An hour goes by fast. Generally, I think three hours is what you need, but most people, if you're working a job, don't have three hours. Yeah. So two hours, I think, you can maybe squeeze in. And if you are working a job, which most people are, Mm -hmm. do you recommend doing this in the morning, at the night? Well, we do an experiment in my class about that, where we spend one week where everyone writes in the morning and one week where everyone writes in the night, and then they decide what actually works better. Some people creatively are better in the evening and some people creatively better in the morning. Generally, I think if you write in the morning, it's better because there's nothing to distract you. Whereas when you're writing in the evening, stuff could have cropped up. Like, oh, suddenly you have to do stay late at work for a project or your kid just broke their leg and you're in the ER, you know, all that stuff. Life takes its own form. So if you can get up early and write and get it done, A, there's a level of satisfaction and you don't have it weighing on you all day of like, I've got to get to my writing time because it becomes addictive too. Right. You know, you want to get to that writing time. Oh, because I was going to say maybe you, if you're doing it at night, you might want to be like, I'm so tired. I don't, I don't want to do it now. Morning, it's like you get, you get it over with. Yeah, get it done. done. Yeah. And I've noticed, too, that if you're under 25, you generally write in the evening. And if you're over 25, you'll write in the morning. I'm under 25. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Lucky you. <laughs> I like writing in the evening. I certainly am not in that oh, category. Really? I've like, what time do you get up to write in the morning? Well, now I've had to do a bit of a dance around it because I have two children, one of whom is still at home. Uh-huh. So I have to write in the nap. Oh, which is at You're midday. Like, keep it going. Keep yeah, it going. <laughs> yeah. So that's been really challenging. But yeah. once he starts school, it will have to be I write once they both are at school. So so it's more about writing a certain amount of time than writing a certain amount of pages. Absolutely. You, okay. So well, you don't say I should write three pages today. No, no, no. Actually, that's not true. Yes, I do. I work from pages. You must write two to four pages a day. And depending on the person and depending on the book, I think you change that. So I always write at least three pages a day and it can be more than that if I want if I can do more than that but for my class I get them to write a minimum of three okay yeah but professionally I usually write four to eight and then you know four to eight that's it that's a lot yeah and with no judgment no editing no No editing it's just free free hand don't edit and not freehand so you can be you can type this part you don't actually have to write because that would then you'd be like Woody Allen or Shakespeare uh, I always like to write with like a feather pen. I think that's. I do all my editing hand with with a pen. I do too. That's because I used to do that, you know, back in my right. editing career. So yeah, I'm right. so used to it. I can't do it. I can't do it with a computer. It doesn't make sense to my brain. It doesn't either. I, I have to go back. Yeah. Okay, so you're writing your pages, and, and then in your class, people are coming back, and then you some of them are, are reading what they wrote yes. to the class, which is so wonderful because usually they all think their stuff's terrible. Yeah. And then when they read it out to the class, they see that the class is absolutely enamored with what they just wrote right and then they get all the positive feedback about what is working and that's Mm -hmm. so inspirational for them to then try a little bit harder for the next week yeah and then they start getting into this lovely zone of wanting to hear the the positive criticism because who doesn't and 
you'll notice the writing gets better and better and better. Yeah. And the reason it gets better and better and better is it's the muscle. They've just been working the muscle longer. Mm-hmm. And this is, you know, I think a sad part about writing is it's a muscle, you know, so yeah. you just got to keep working it. And it's sad, but it's true. It's just really mundane fact, you know. And so, so by the end of the book, they're writing really, really well. Yeah. And they go back and look at some of the start, which they thought was amazing. Right. And, and it's like- not. You know, yeah, they realized that. Really like, but wait, wasn't. the class told me this was amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, you know, they're only allowed to to tell you what's good, so you, you don't know any better. You know? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but then, of course, you have the wisdom and the muscles really strong, so then you can go back and edit it and make it amazing, and that's the trick. So, so take me that. Let's okay. So now four weeks has passed because really they only have four weeks to, yeah. to do the writing. Yeah. So they write every day for at least two to three hours, and they're writing three pages a day. And uh, it, it causes a lot of problems in their lives, which is yeah. really interesting. Like partners get really annoyed, friends yep. get annoyed, kids get annoyed. Bosses you know? get annoyed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's challenging. Yeah. It's not easy. It's certainly no. not easy. But there is such a thrill to it. It's like training for a marathon. And, um, and you actually finish it. Yeah. And then they finish it and uh, there's such a sense of achievement. And then I start talking to them about editing, how, they, how they're going to edit it. So... Talk to me a little bit about that. There's different, you had different editing passes, right? So there's yeah. an editing for story. Right. So I go through your major edits should be edit for character, edit for plot, uh, edit for genre. And so what does this mean when you say edit for character, edit for plot? What so you're going to read your manuscript just looking for how you can change things. Let's say we're editing for character. You're just going to be reading your manuscript and taking notes to flesh out, develop, expand, and be more creative about your lead character. So we're just going to do it on one character, right? Yeah. So what this does is it it focuses the mind on only one aspect of the book. So because otherwise it's too overwhelming. You have you know let's say three hundred pages of a novel. There's a million things you want to change, and you don't even know where to start. So if you just focus on one thing and read through, just looking for that one thing, you just make notes on. Okay, so my lead character has a twitch and loves eating bananas and is scared of cats, right? Yeah. So you're going through and you're just looking for how you can add little things that honor those parameters. And you go through and you write notes. You go through and write notes just for that. And then you'll go through and do a pass for another character. So it takes a long yeah. time to do these passes. I think the one thing about doing that that might be tricky is it's, as you're doing your character pass, you're also noticing, ooh, I don't like... Uh, yes. the setting or whatever yes. pass you're doing. And I always say to my students, don't worry, you won't forget. Yeah, you'll come back and Yeah, do like that. they'll be like, oh, I need to write notes about that. It's like, if you didn't like it this time, you won't like it the next right. time you read it either. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to forget that you hated that part of the book. Yeah. But that is the problem. And that's why I like them to be laser focused because right. otherwise you get too distracted. And you want to make sure things are consistent as you go through. So let's say as you're you're doing your character pass, you, you start developing that this character has this imaginary best friend mm-hmm. that was never really in the first draft. You want to make sure you carry that all the way through the, the whole story so that it makes sense. Yeah. And if you're distracted by suddenly editing for setting or editing for plot or whatever, you're going to maybe forget about that and not keep it flowing through the book. So you really want to just focus on one thing at a time. So character... Plot, setting, genre, genre, um, and then uh, cliche. Do you do a cliche pass? That's a good pass. Cliches, yeah. You know, that's a writer's. Uh, yeah, no, uh, I like that one. Burden. I'm going to add that one. A cliche pass. <laughs> I also do a flow pass, like if everything's flowing, and then, but that's usually a, a last pass. The genre pass is really important because let's say your genre is thriller. You want to go through and make sure it's thrilling the whole way through. You know, you don't want it just to be thrilling at the start and part of the middle, and then it kind of gets a bit mundane or turns into a drama. Yeah. You've got to keep it thrilling. You know, if someone spent $7.99 on your your paperback copy at Barnes & Noble for a reason, you know, so you want to keep it thrilling all the way through. And same with comedy, romance. You want to, you know, you may have a scene that you've written and it's supposed to be a comedy and it's not funny. Yeah, you know, it's supposed to be comedy, so find something funny about it. You know, like it doesn't have to be every line, but it should represent. But, and a you're comedy. also making me remember that one of the excuses I hear sometimes is like, "Well, I don't really know how to write a mystery because, you know, mysteries there's like rules, right, of mysteries yeah. like the so like with a thriller, a romantic comedy, 
I know in screenplays there are definitely like beats that you want to hit. And is right. it the same with books? Like, or like, should you go? No, I think books you can play with a lot more. Okay. And I think those rules can be helpful. So I don't think you should steer away from them, but I also don't think you need to stick to them. Right. I think that's the great thing about novels is there are no rules. Mm -hmm. You can do whatever you want, but I think you, you need to always make sure that the reader is engaged. That rule never goes away. If there's a point where your reader is not engaged, you need to put something in there to bring it back. And how do you know your reader won't be engaged? Do you just Is it your gut instinct? Because you're not engaged. Okay. Like you'll read what you've written and get bored. And you're like, oh, okay, I'm bored here. They're going to be bored too. So throw in a red herring, throw in a clown walking past. Alien monsters throw in on anything. a trip. Throw in, throw, it doesn't really matter. Just something to, to wake them up. To clarify, these passes are happening after your class right? No. Oh, well, they're not. this is the thing. If you're a very good student of mine, <laughs> <laughs> you'll be able to get maybe through two of those passes in the last week. Yeah. But generally people just manage to write the book and, and just get to the end. Yeah. So they don't really have that luxury. Usually the editing for them is them just fixing things up a little bit. Right. But yeah, so after the class, and that's what I say, after you go away, this is now what you're going to work on. You're going to do all these editing passes. And the editing passes create your second draft. Because mm -hmm. people are like, how do I make a second draft? I've wrote yeah. the book. This is what it is. It's yeah. like, no, it's no. not. This, this is your bad novel. Yeah, this is the bad version of yeah. your book. You know, So by doing these editing passes, you're going to start stimulating ideas and creative impulses of how to expand things out and make it more layered. You know, the main problem people have writing it and the criticism they'll get is this is not layered enough. This is not developed enough. What does layered enough mean? Realistic. Okay. So, and realistic, realism comes in usually through sensorials and minutia of like what's happening to the character. Right. Uh, like he picked up the paper cup. Well, instead of that, it's like he grasped the cardboard edges of the, the paper cup in the cool section of the yeah. case. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're just in getting detail. into it a little bit more, it's more so that we can feel it and believe it. Mm -hmm. um, smells, tastes, Sensations. sounds, yeah. more feelings, more understanding of the characters. And people are generally lazy and think, well, I've written, I've written my book. It's yeah. done. But honestly, the more you do it, the fun is in the editing. The mm -hmm. fun is in the layering of then taking this thing, chipping away at it. And sometimes you'll make a change and that will affect the entire The whole thing. Book. So you might, I mean, you might really have to make some significant, yeah. significant changes. Yeah. And I know that that's very intimidating, but yeah. that's the process. Yeah. And you have to honor that. So uh, those passes, so there's a second draft and then how many drafts are there before you really can feel like I'd say I'm six. Done? Six of those. At least okay. six. And you keep doing passes using the same, you know, characters. Plot. Yeah, and I think you'll start to realize where there's a big gaping hole. Usually it's plot or character, yeah. you know, and uh, you have to then go in and say, okay, this is cliched or this is boring or it's not dynamic enough or it's not realistic enough. And then really spend some time getting in there going, well, how can this be more realistic? What elements of this world am I not bringing to this novel? Right. And you'll know once you've been reading it for a while and, you know, if you do, once you've through to maybe four drafts, you might want to show it to someone yep. and get some feedback. And that's hard because you really have to get the right person to give you feedback <laughs> because, you How know. How do you find that? I mean, aside hard. from you, who's really good. Someone you, you get trust. A professional. Okay. Someone you trust who you think has really good objective opinions about stuff. Like my husband's excellent. Mm -hmm. Like he'll give me comments that my agents then end up giving me oh right like, so why even like have an agent yeah <laughs> yeah I'll just give him the just 10%. give him the 10 <laughs> yeah but someone you know who's who's bringing up issues that are real rather mm -hmm. than someone who's just bringing up any issue to show off you know to show off that they're creative and wonderful you know you want someone who's not <laughs> not an egomaniac giving you notes <laughs> so what's the fastest you've seen a good what's the fastest sort of time frame so there's a 10 weeks to sort of get the bad novel out mm-hmm and then how do you get, where do you get to the, I mean, is it any, is there a time frame? Can it be as long as? I think someone can do it in six months. Okay. But that's usually someone who's maybe already in the writing field, who, yep. who's used to writing and possibly has more time than other people to write, like someone who's retired mm -hmm. or at home and, and has the luxury of four or five hours a day. But I think it's reasonable for someone to spend a year mm -hmm. on a book 
and should be able to get out a pretty good draft that then will probably be reworked a lot through agents and editors. So, you know, even though you think it's done, then when you get it into the professional realm, it's going to be a whole other level of working it. editing it. And that can be very hard because you're often over it by that stage. Is there any moment where you should just put it in your drawer and not look at it for a little while? Do you ever do that where you sort of say, okay, I did this final edit and now I'm going to put it away for three months and then I'm going to revisit it when I'm sort of, when it's my head is more clear. I tend to think no. I think you're writing a story at this time for a reason. And I think if you, you put it away for a certain amount of months, you've given up on it. And it stops your momentum. Yeah, the momentum's gone. And also the reason why you wrote it often is gone. So let's say, because I believe there's like a subconscious reason you're writing a book Mm -hmm. that you may not be aware of. So let's say the subconscious reason is you're struggling in your marriage about some element of your marriage. And the book could have nothing to do with that, you think. Like it could be about two dogs who go on an adventure through the woods together. And so if you then put it away for three months... Maybe you solve that issue within your marriage. Yep. And when you come back to the book, you don't know why you wrote it. And you're not that interested in it anymore. Right, it just wasn't in that moment. And the passion's kind of gone for... Because you're, you're basically trying to solve a question within yourself by writing a book. And if you solve that question yourself too early, the need to write the book's gone. And I think that's dangerous. I think you need to stay with the book and just get it done. It's kind of like any job you have. You're working on a project at work. They're not going to want you to just put it aside for a few months and come back to it. You know, they just yeah. want you to get it done. Just get it You done. know, like have the deadlines, get it done. And I think by creating the deadlines and getting it done, you tell the universe you're serious about it and you get it done. You know, yeah. and, and, and the fact of the matter is sometimes it's just doing the work. It's not so much about emotionally and understanding the material you're doing it's like sometimes you've got to let go of that a little bit and just do the work and see what comes out without you being so controlling but i i think moving away from things is dangerous well this has been fantastic (laughs) this is like my favorite no offense to my other guests but i learned so much in this last hour i could just keep you here for another hour thank you so much tempany for joining us thank you thank you for having me (laughs) and i hope you'll come back when you talk about a million other things awesome (laughs) okay thanks bye bye that was super interesting right really recommend her class if you happen to be in the la area all right so next week we have dan bova of entrepreneur.com the editorial director of entrepreneur.com will be in this studio well, he actually won't be in the studio. He'll be in New York, but he'll sort of be in the studio and he'll be giving you advice on what entrepreneur is looking for, his incredible career from being a magazine editor at Maxim Magazine, a Spy Magazine, all the way through to Entrepreneur. I think you'll get a lot of valuable lessons from that. But until that time comes, remember I'm Jonathan Small with Writing Partner Consulting, encouraging you always to do the right thing.